Today in nuclear medicine snacks we are going to look at some small aspects of radiation protection. I don't know if all of you started out in nuclear medicine like I did to get superpowers but preferably we want to not go there and start a whole new evolution. When working with ionizing radiation it's important to know the difference between ionizing which has more energy, shorter wavelengths, and non-ionizing, which has longer wavelengths and has less energy and is therefore not dangerous to humans. In this area, Wi-Fi signal, 5G, and all of that falls in the non-ionizing category. Therefore, the conspiracy theories, in my opinion, is not valid. It's not dangerous to have a cell phone and to use it. In radiation, we talk about a, a nucleus of an unstable atom that releases energy through gamma radiation, alpha radiation that has particulate heavy emissions, and beta radiation, which demonstrates high energy electrons. It's important to know the differences because they cause different amounts of damage, and you have to adapt your practice accordingly. All of these falls into the ionizing category and is dangerous and should be worked with care. Here is the differences. As you can see, alpha emitters has a stronger emission, higher energy, shorter range, or what we call linear energy transfer, but it can be stopped by paper, so it's only harmful when ingested. Beta minus emission travels further and has to be shielded by aluminium and not only paper but it also has a sh uh, lot lower linear energy transfer than alpha emissions it can cause damage both inside and outside the body and then you get gamma emissions that travel through the body paper aluminium and has to be stopped by lead shielding so you have a bit of a thicker lead shielding needed for these emissions to protect you and then neutrons, which is used in, in reactors, can only be stopped by concrete and water. So, the differences between loose particles and fixed activity. Loose particles that are radioactive can be inhaled or ingested and can be dangerous because they are taken into the body and they are exposing critical organs. Fixed activities where you have uh, surfaces that are contaminated and then there is also an issue of where you are exposed to radiation. From a source is from the outside irradiating your body, the surface or even deeper if it's gamma emissions but it can be removed. On the body surface is when your hands are contaminated and you need some decontamination procedures. Then if you take in the radioactivity by ingestion or inhalation or through wounds or radiopharmaceutical injection, it is internalized into your body, it's more dangerous and you cannot remove it. So it has to be either excreted or decayed. When you look at the different types of emission, gamma emission from inside the body when injected goes straight through the body and has a low linear energy transfer, it goes uh, quite far away so that it can reach the camera from inside the body and you can take useful pictures. So it's in essence not so dangerous as some of the other radioactive nuclei that you can work with once ingested. It is safe for the patient and it decays quite fast. But if you work with it on a constant basis, you have to shield properly with thick lead shielding when you work with these because constant exposure is a radiation source from the outside and the amount of radioactivity you are exposed to accumulates. Beta minus emission is dangerous when ingested. The ear cold can also irradiate you from the outside, but if it's on your skin, it will penetrate, and indeed, sometimes it's used for treating skin cancer. It has a linear energy transfer that is high enough to cause cytotoxic damage to tissues, and it travels quite far, up to 10 millimeters. 
It is dangerous when contaminated on the skin, ingested, injection, or inhaled. Alpha particles, on the other hand, is not dangerous when it exposed, uh, it's contaminating your skin. There is no skin penetration. However, it is severely dangerous when ingested or inhaled or injected. And of course, if you have contamination anywhere, the chances of inhalation and ingestion increases. So one has to be very careful when working with alpha particles. It's highly cytotoxic and can damage both strands of the DNA and cause further abnormalities. The annual skin limit for exposure is 500 millisieverts. The annual hands and feet is 500 millisieverts. The lens of the eye was decreased, decreased to 20 millisieverts and then of course 20 millisieverts whole body exposure average over five years. This is a very ugly picture <laughs> that I drew with the eyes, so I had to add the eyes um, of particular interest for myself is the eye exposure because long-term exposure can lead to cataracts and all of these effects, which I've seen in some of my colleagues. So it's better to always ensure that you work behind lead shielding and maybe get appropriate lead glasses. So should we be afraid? Indeed, you have to always be careful, but the decrease in life expectancy overall is based on your whole lifestyle and your quality of life. So there's all of these other factors. And if you look at coffee, two cups per day, I drink around 12 to 16 cups of coffee a day. So I have other problems. <laughs> you can see that a radiation worker on average will use, will lose 25 days. I mean, just being living in poverty or being a male loses you a lot more days. So there is a lot to consider. I'm not saying that we should underestimate the, say, uh, underestimate the risks of working with radiation, but it's an overall lifestyle change. Maybe take the stairs instead of the lift and then work with your radioactivity. The four factors that you can use to reduce your exposure is time. So you can always do cold practice runs before you work with radioactivity, up your technique and spend less time near sources. I always find it useful to wear an electronic dosimeter that gives you a warning sign when you're near radioactivity because it makes you sensitive towards radiation around you. Distance also very important. Spend a greater distance from the source always with more space between you and the radioactive source if you can. I see this often with people that work longer term with radiation. They would start doing little things that may, may not be optimal, like taking the ball quickly with their hands instead of using tweezer. All of these things does contribute to your dose. Shielding is critical and this is where you have to ensure that your environment is safe and that your bosses take this seriously and provide you with the necessary equipment. It is often very expensive to get the right shielding, but it's worth the investment in your health. Thicker lead shielding or with beta minus emissions, ensuring that there is a prospect shield before the lead is very critical. Dose, I think it's one that I've added myself here. It's not often mentioned, but only work with the activity you need. So why use more activity when you can reach the same goal with less? Then it's important to know that there's two different effects of radiation. There is the deterministic effects, which is the acute effects, and it's based on principles of cell death. It has a dose threshold, so these will only happen at a certain dose reached. And it's like radiation sickness and burnt skin. And of course, you can always stop or shield against these principles and it is more manageable in essence. The stochastic effect is based on DNA mutation and it's always present in the background. There is no threshold dose. So when you work, your risks increase with 
you know, working with radioactivity every day, but it differs from person to person when these effects will precipitate. And an example is cancer or mutation. So you have to do a risk assessment when you're going to work. You have to look at the radiation source, its characteristics, what is the ideal shielding for this, and you have to optimize your procedure for the radiation source that you are working with. Your environment must be optimized with shielding, the necessary uh, extraction fans and everything you need. If your radiation source is volatile, you have to make sure your environment caters for decontamination and also isolation of your environment that you work with. The time and frequency you work has to be evaluated critically and optimization is key. What you are intending to do is very important and you should know what is allowed or what is good practice and what not. There I've had some experience in the past where we did some techniques that was less optimal and we had to revisit that, like homogenization of radioactivity or stuff like that you should not do. Is there any alternatives to radioactive work? Maybe if you do in vitro work, you can do bioluminescence or other alternatives, genetic assays, anything like that. You should always consider alternatives. And you should have the measures and precautions ready to help you do your work. Just to end off, Becquerel is the amount of radioactivity. Gray is the amount of biological exposure that you will have. And Sievert is what effect this biologic activity will have since certain tissues have different effects. So for instance, your gastrointestinal system is much more um, at risk from radiation than other tissue and every biological tissue uh, reacts differently to the different radiation exposure per grade. Please uh, like and subscribe if you found this informative. Please comment down below if you want me to uh, elaborate on certain subjects or if there is other things you want me to discuss. This is an interactive channel and I learn through you. I also want to thank Byrinder for the amazing illustrative program that they've made available to scientists.